Hey, First Church family. My name's Chris Akins. And I'm Avery Rhodes. And these are our kids, Rosie, Walt, Scarlett, Hopper, and the twins. And we love First Church because of the community that it offers and because it embodies God's love and acceptance of all people. Happy, Happy Halloween! People think we want to be like them, but pretty soon they'll all be like us. <laughs> Good morning. I am Kristen Dedman, your Minister of Children, and I hope you enjoyed that welcome video from one of our spookiest families. Now, if you have been in in-person worship with me, you know that we do lots of wiggles and moving. And so now for virtual worship, I invite you to wiggle your fingers. Take a deep breath and stretch your arms. Wiggle your arms, your legs, your toes. We know that this type of movement helps with emotional regulation for children and helps to prepare their bodies for worship. And it does the same for adults. Now friends, I have lots of announcements to share with you. First, on November 7th, we will have our All Saints Sunday Remembrance Service in both the loft, the, worship, the sanctuary, and here on virtual worship. It will be a time for us to gather to remember those whom we have lost in the last year. Also on November 7th, we will have our district superintendent, Rick Owen, in worship with us. And then following the worship service at 1230 in the sanctuary, we will have our charge conference. Now, charge conferences are gatherings that United Methodist Churches have annually to reflect on the last year, to look at the upcoming slate of lay leadership, and then to discuss the state of the church. All are invited. Again, it's at 1230 in the sanctuary on November 7th for our charge conference. And finally, our fun team is planning a friend's giving meal. And we hope you and your family and your friends and your neighbors will all join us November 14th in the afternoon for a great meal that we'll share outside together. It will be $13 for adults and $8 for kids. You can register on our website on the coming up tab and let us know you're coming. It will be a great time of fellowship and we encourage you to invite everyone you know. It'll be a great way for them to get to know us and for us to get to know you all. Welcome to worship.
Hear these words from Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Please join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
My name is Katie Gilbert, and I serve as our executive pastor. This morning, I invite you to hear the words from our second scripture reading, which comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. Hear these words. Even if someone lived a thousand years, make it two thousand, but didn't enjoy anything. What's the point? Doesn't everyone end up in the same place? We work to feed our appetites. Meanwhile, our souls go hungry. Today, we continue in our series, Searching for the Soul. And as a part of that, we will talk about the practices that nourish the soul. Here at First Church, we strive to offer as many opportunities as we can for nourishment of the soul, whether that be through having dinner together with your dinner group, hiking together in nature, or if it's learning and studying in a small group listening to beautiful music and worship, or maybe it's even exploring the practices of silence and meditation. All of these are ways that we nourish the soul. The only way that we are able to continue to offer these opportunities and to grow and expand them even wider and greater is through your generosity. This is what sustains us and allows us the room to think creatively about new ways to nourish the soul. And so this morning, I invite you to give generously because friends, together our generosity allows us to explore the ways that we can care and feed our souls. As we explore the soul, I want to invite you to slow down and give yourself permission to question, to explore, to take the space and the time you need to settle into the moment so that you can listen to your soul. Today we begin by going deeper into our exploration. Last week I shared with you about Rabbi Marcus and his remarkable life. I want to explore a little more the aspects of his life's journey. As Rabbi Marcus and others came upon and then freed the boys that they found at Buchenwald, they discovered a seven-year-old boy hiding in a pile of corpses. 
They went to him, and another rabbi, with tears streaming down his face, lifted him up from the bodies, and he asked him his name. The child told him, Look it. Then he asked him how old he was, and the child responded, Why does it matter? I'm older than you. The rabbi asked, Why do you think you're older than me? And Lukic said, Because you still laugh and cry like a child. I have not laughed in a long time, and I no longer cry. These boys had seen atrocities and humanity that was beyond what anybody should bear. They lived with it every day, expecting death. They looked like death, yet somehow they clung to life, but devoid of joy and devoid of hope. They had their families and their childhoods ripped from them savagely, and these boys became Rabbi Marcus's personal mission. When he and others entered the camp and declared that these boys were free, it was the first time that they had ever seen a soldier who wore the golden star of David. It was the first time that they realized that that star could symbolize life and freedom again. Rabbi Marcus became determined to help them become children, children who once again felt safe and loved. And despite having the opportunity to fly back home, to be with his own family, and to meet his baby daughter, he stayed many more months caring for these boys. He was the first to lead them in prayer while they were still inside the camp. He personally escorted them from the concentration camp to a shelter. He then personally helped them establish a farming community in Germany where they had their bodies and their minds nourished, where they learned how to farm the soil in preparation for their homes. Rabbi Levy shares that Marcus wrote, They have cows, horses, sheep, oxen, and tractors. They have learned to laugh again, to play and sing, and to dwell on things of the Spirit. He was reviving their souls. He then personally took many of them to France to be restored with relatives. And then all those remaining, he personally took them to Palestine, where they formed their home in their own kibbutz. Only then did he return to his family back in the U.S., what propelled Marcus to act in these ways? What causes him to be driven by the suffering of others that he willingly took on suffering on his own to help lift them up out of theirs? His soul. Specifically, the aspect of his soul called nefesh, the life force. Nefesh is the blue hue of the flame on the candle, which we discussed last week in Jewish mysticism. It's the foundational level of our souls. It's the elemental form for all of us. All have nefesh as it dwells in our bodies. Rabbi Levi says the greatest gift of the life force is the power to act, to rise above our own paralysis and to transform intention into achievement. Rabbi Marcus was empowered by his life force, his soul, to do something, to rise above the temptation to believe that the task was too big, to move beyond the paralysis and instead transform his desire and intention for restoration of the world into action, making it happen. We all have this ability because we all have the soul. It's learning to nourish our souls that will enable us to let them guide and feed us. It is our souls that will lead us, but only if we first learn to give to them what they need. Rabbi Levy says, we earn a living and feed our egos and surround ourselves with all sorts of stuff, but we remain hungry because we don't understand what our souls need. Our souls come from the place of eternity and it longs for those things. It longs for God, for beauty, for nature, for learning, for love, for unity, and for peace. You heal the soul by giving it what it needs. So I read these words the evening before I was to write this sermon, and I instantly knew what my soul was longing for, to go home. It had been on way too long since I had been home to my parents' house. I had seen them, 
but not by going home to them. I needed to be in their house, to see the pasture where I grew up, the trees, to walk the land barefoot, to be greeted by Ziggy, their tenacious Yorkie, and to enjoy being present there, even if it meant I was going to have to write my sermon in my upstairs childhood bedroom. So that's what I did. I quit pushing down what I needed. I quit saying that I was too busy, even though the whole ride down to Prattville, I was tempted to berate myself for taking the time to go. I went and I felt my soul breathe deep. I needed to go home. But the only way I was even able to access the truth of what my soul wanted was, was by beginning to cultivate a different nightly rhythm. One that tries to allow space for me to tap into what I'm feeling and what I'm needing. You see, right now, for me, that means I need to carve out some space for reflection and quiet. I'm trying to find ways to do that outside of numbing, right, with the TV or my phone or a glass of wine. While those can seem satisfying in the moment, they don't often lead me to know deeply what I'm longing for. For me, in the stillness of some quiet, I knew that I needed to change my scenery and to go hug my parents' necks. What does your soul need? Are you even aware of it? Do you let it surface before you push it down, shaming its neediness and its longing, shooting it back to the darkest reaches of your mind? I do those things a lot. I push through to the next thing that my ego or my job or my family responsibility makes me feel is so urgent and so important. But my friends, we will have no real way of knowing what is most needed and what is most urgent if we don't first tend to our souls. Our bodily, fundamental level of our soul is nefesh, the aspect of our soul that has the capacity to stir us to action instead of paralysis. Levy shares with us a plethora of practices that can help us become more in tune to this level of awareness for our souls. Daily, weekly, monthly rhythms that invite us to awaken and to listen to our bodies, to hear and to sense what they are uniquely inviting us to do in the world. She explains meditation is medicine for the body and the soul. She says through meditation we can learn to raise the volume of our soul's voice so that we can begin to hear what it is trying to tell us. We live with noisy minds, self-loathing minds that judge us and bark demands at us all day, even in our dreams. We so often fear that if we don't talk to ourselves in that way, that we'll be lazy and we won't accomplish anything. But what if, what if we're wrong? What if the barking and the demanding is simply drowning out our soul? This past week in our grief group, Dr. Catherine Clayton Prince, who's a member here and who leads that group with me, shared with us about setting intentions and the difference between an intention and a goal. She said, goals are about what we want to accomplish, what we need to accomplish or to get done. Intentions are about who we want to be, how we want to move through the day or through life. One of those, I believe, puts us in closer touch with our souls than the other, setting an intention. Levy teaches there is a Hebrew word, husa, that we would all do well to hold in our mind and our heart. Husa, she shares, is the special kind of love that an artist has for his or her own creation, even when it's imperfect. It's compassion for something that is flawed. And that is why, she explains, Jews turn to God and ask for husa in their prayers. The soul is yours, the body is your creation. Husa, have compassion for your work. My next door neighbor is an elementary school teacher, art teacher in particular, and she regularly posts pictures of her students' art on Instagram. Their art isn't obviously the work of Picasso or Monet, but she loves it, and she loves sharing it and honoring it. That is Husa. It's why parents hang their children's art on the fridge or frame it. It's love without judgment. This is the environment our soul longs for. It's where our souls are meant to thrive, and it doesn't come natural to us. 
We cling to the negative and the critical. So we must practice compassion to ourselves first and then others. Levy invites us to begin with five minutes of quiet in a comfortable position and to simply hold the word and the idea of husa in our mind's eye. When that pushy, critical, negative voice arrives as it will, don't berate it or punish it. Have mercy on it. Be understanding of it. Invite it to rest. Have compassion. And in time, let your five minutes become ten minutes and so on. As we sit with Husha, compassionate love for self, it will grow to compassionate love for others. Levy also shares that listening to music can help bring forth our soul's longings. I imagine this is why many of you tune in to worship. It soothes and comforts, it invigorates and enlivens, it brings life and it heals. Music touches our souls. So can food. Rabbi Levy shares that food can connect the soul in love and it can create community. Recipes get passed down from one generation to another. The flavors and the aromas you grew up with remind you of who you are and who you belong to, where you come from. This is so true. When my dad's mother died many years ago, I inherited her KitchenAid mixer. I couldn't cook at the time, but it became important to me to learn to learn to make some of the things that she, my granny, loved to make. Cakes, divinity, fudge, pralines. Obviously, she loved her sweets, and so do I. When I cook with that mixer, my soul is connected and renewed. Nature also restores the soul. I know you know this because our hiking small group over the last year has done so well. We have a deep longing to be connected in creation. Levy writes, our souls are pleading for us to get away from our stuff, our possessions and our smartphones, and to see God among the grasses and the trees. This changes us. It changes our focus. Rabbi Levy asked a classroom full of students when she was teaching, what was the first thing on their minds when they wake up? So I want you to take just a minute and to think about that. What is it for you? What's on your mind when you wake up, before you get out of bed? Is it your schedule for the day? Do you wonder if you can sleep longer or do you need to go work out? Do you wonder if you need to get the kids up or what you're going to make for breakfast? Do you rush to your phone and check your email or social media accounts? What if the first thing on your mind was a prayer? What if a prayer of gratitude was the first thing that we thought of to offer in our day? Rabbi Levy encourages us to try for two weeks to wake up and to offer a simple prayer of gratitude before even getting out of bed and to see if we notice a shift in our souls. And finally, she offers us a way to access our soul through the gift of Sabbath, rest. The Talmud, which is commentary on the Torah, describes the gift of Sabbath as a glimpse of the world to come. It is a gift to us. It is the opportunity to remember that we are human beings, not human doings. We do not earn our value. We cannot add to it by accomplishing more. And when we live in ways constantly striving to show our value and our worth, we wear our souls out. Instead, our souls need us to rest to be, to savor, to slow down, to practice stillness, and to frolic. You can only frolic when you know that you are enough without having to do more. We are meant to enjoy the gift of rest and life. It is a necessity to awaken our souls. What does your nefesh, your life force, your soul need? Only you can discover this. For your soul, while connected to mine and all others, it is uniquely your own. You can likely discover what it longs for and what it needs by offering it space to meditate, to listen to good music, to savor good food and community, to spend time in nature, to pray with gratitude, and to take time to rest. These are the ways that bring your soul to life so that you can speak from your soul. So that then, like Rabbi Marcus, you can become what you're meant to for the world. 
so that you can find what your soul is calling you, your truest self to be, and your life's mission to fulfill. Our souls are aching to teach us who we truly are. And it is aching for us to know that we don't have to do more. I invite you to make space this week for listening to what our souls are needing, to tune in to what you are longing for and to offer yourself, your soul, husa, compassion in response to its needs. Thanks be to God for the compassionate grace that covers us all the days of our life. Amen. Please join me for our affirmation of faith. We believe in divine oneness, which creates and connects us all together. We believe in the embodiment of Christ's presence in the world, moving us towards forgiveness and grace. We believe in the Spirit's creative indwelling that nurtures our soul and showers us with love. We believe we are called to love the Lord our God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We believe we are called to love our neighbors near and far. We believe we are called to love ourselves, imperfect yet worthy. We believe we are to care for creation. We believe we are all one. Amen.
May you take time this week to slow down, to listen deeply, to cultivate a rhythm that allows you space to feel, to hear, to know what your soul is longing for. And then may you have the courage to be moved to action, to give to your soul what it needs. In the name of our Creator, our Savior, and Sustainer, Alleluia. Amen.